Orleans. You're not in New Orleans anymore. <laughs> I ain't no New Orleans no more. We're moving to Mississippi. This is James' country voice, y'all. Around the country, y'all. As you can see, James, I think James is okay. Maybe he's stuck this way. <laughs> Nobody don't know. What's up, y'all? Uh, we are broadcasting from the country this time. We are in St. Francisville where James evacuated to, and as you can see, the storm is past and everything is all right. It's very sunny and it's hot. <laughs> it's back to being summer again. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and we're very fortunate in St. Francisville that we have power and water and things like that, which is not true of a lot of the state of Louisiana right now. That's right. Yeah, so we checked in a couple days ago, me and Roby from down in New Orleans. Roby's still there by his own choice. Um, and then I have gotten up to St. Francisville where James and some of his family have been writing the whole thing out, the town that we're from. Watch our video about St. Francisville if you want to explore it a little bit. Um, but a lot of y'all in your very like much appreciated concern for our team down here were asking about how James was doing, so I wanted to show you. He's in one piece. Everything is a-okay. And, uh, and yes, St. Francisville, where we are, which is a little north of Baton Rouge, did just fine, but we are, the, the picture of what's up in New Orleans is a lot clearer now than when we first recorded that last video yeah New Orleans and the rest of the state which I think is worth talking about you know yeah. if you guys were watching the storm uh, Sunday night the original path was predicted to be a little more to the west and would have actually come straight through st. Francisville where we are now and sort of at the last minute it veered a little bit east which was good news for st. Francisville but bad news for a lot of uh, a lot of the communities along the I-55 corridor so Laplace Louisiana um, and and Covington Mandeville everything on the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain, um, those guys got hit real hard, um, and they're they're feeling it right now. People are still being rescued. The waters are still rising. There's this phenomena that happens with a big storm like this that you don't even think about. But there's the storm surge where it pushes water inland, and this storm actually pushed so much water inland that the Mississippi River parts of it were they say it's flowing backwards, which is not true empirically but like you know the water is being pushed upstream more than it's pushing downstream and that has continued and a few days after the storm continued um, making river levels rise throughout southern Louisiana so some places in St. Tammany Parish were experiencing new flooding events a day two days after the storm so it's an ongoing situation here yeah that's one of these things with like ev everybody's heard of New Orleans but there's so many other places that get affected by these things <laughs> the <care. laughs> We didn't bring our camera tripod, and the camera is attached to a rocking chair, and there's wind. <laughs> oh, everything's jerry-rigged right now, y'all. We are, we are making it work. Um, <laughs> yes, so the, the, the gently, the breeze is gently rocking, y'all. Um, yeah, so like for example, a lot more people heard about Hurricane Katrina than heard about Hurricane Laura, at least at much length. Even though Hurricane Laura, when it hit Lake Charles and other parts of the west side of Louisiana was a much stronger hurricane when it made landfall yeah. than Katrina was when it did so. And so the, the fact that New Orleans has the, the reputation and the familiarity and the kind of household name status that it does really you know, amplifies our certainly real concerns over somewhat often significantly bigger ones in other places that are just less famous. Yeah, definitely. The national news coverage will definitely lean towards New Orleans and has been, but there's a lot of other communities out here that are hurting right now. Um, that definitely need help and you know we're working on working on starting to recover and we also want to share some ways that if y'all wanted to help out we've had some great questions about ways to donate ways to even volunteer in some of your cases which is an amazing impulse and we definitely want to inform that to the best of our ability and this won't be by any means a comprehensive or an exhaustively researched thing we've been mainly cleaning yards out in my mom's backyard and James and his wife Helen who's Hi, Helen. <laughs> um, doing, I uh, did some cleanup here yesterday, and, and Roby and I were uh, doing cleanup at my partner Jeff's parents' house. So we have not been doing the deep, deep dive on this stuff. We're going to just share a little bit of what we know, and certainly there are many other really worthwhile sources to go to out there. So I know you've been doing some donating already, James. What are, what were you looking at? Yeah, there's a number of different places, and it's you know it's honestly a tricky environment right after a storm. 
Um, but there's a number of different places where you can find out about good opportunities to help people. Um, one of the organizations that I donated to and that's worth looking at is the Cajun Navy, and we'll put the link up here on the screen. Um, I'll put the link up here on the screen. Uh, <laughs> the Royal We. The Cajun Navy is a volunteer organization. It's a nonprofit. They started right after Hurricane Katrina, and they've been building infrastructure ever since. But it's basically a, a group of volunteers with boats and heavy equipment and know-how who, um, after a disaster like this, can go into an area and help rescue people, pull people out of houses, and then also provide supplies, you know. Um, in these moments after a storm, the things that people need are like gasoline becomes really scarce. We've seen it running out at gas stations across the area. Uh, especially true because Southern Louisiana has so many refineries, so much gasoline is produced here. When those, those refineries can't operate, suddenly there's a, a backlog. Um, uh, people need gasoline, people need uh, clean drinking water, people need food, um, people need you know, power, the ability to charge a phone, that sort of thing. Um, and the Cajun Navy is one of many organizations that can help provide that. So they're definitely worth checking out. Um, I'll also say there's a lot of direct aid, mutual aid organizations um, that are worth looking into. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get too into that here only because it's a little bit of a confusing landscape right now and the way that those payments work keeps changing. There's also, um, unfortunately, groups of people who are pretending to be those aid organizations and who are not. So please, you know, take the time and make sure that you're donating to the right group if you choose to make a donation. Um, you know, those mutual aid organizations can sometimes get more direct help to people on the ground, but they're also a lot easier to defraud. So just be wary of that. I've been following on Instagram uh, the Tinder meteorologist um, who has been giving us a lot of great weather updates but also has been sharing a lot of information about what aid organizations are doing and what things are going, sharing posts that people are making. Um, and then the other one, uh, it's going to be an expletive, I don't know what to do. Um, there's a, a, an Instagram account called Look at This Fucking Street which has been a New Orleans Instagram account for a long time, mostly talking about the condition of the roadways in New Orleans. Uh, but during the storm, they've become another sort of clearing ground for uh, aid organizations. Pothole and, porn is a classic social media yeah. thing in New Orleans, and this kind of is rooted in that, but yeah. then it's really, really risen to the occasion with this problem. Absolutely, they have, yeah. And, uh, and one other, I got to chat with some friends who are in town working with World Central Kitchen, which is Chef Jose Andres' organization, also created in the follow-up of Hurricane Katrina. And one of the things that didn't go so great after Katrina, among many, um, was food distribution and where some very viable sites like the Superdome, for example, that could have been used really well for food prep had they been prepared beforehand were not used. And so um, this organization now, I mean, they, I was seeing them in town like the first full day after the storm that we had and they were already setting up and they were gonna be serving food from noon onwards. And they could not only use donations, which you can go to their website and there's a link to get straight to where to donate specifically for Hurricane Ida related relief. And that's all gonna go to feeding people on a daily basis in many parts of New Orleans. And also they need some volunteer help. I was talking with a representative of theirs who said that whether you are a culinary professional or not, they have jobs to do on both sides. So I know some people who were planning a trip to New Orleans, assuming that there's the ability to get in somewhere to stay, you know, the ability to fly into town, many variables still to be figured out on this front. But if you were one of those amazing people thinking about coming in and spending what was gonna be your vacation time volunteering instead, that's one organization to look at. And, you know, based on the situation in New Orleans right now, which is blessedly not flood related, but instead wind damage related power outages, the power is still out across the entire city as of today. Um, inability to prepare food and to keep food safe because of lack of refrigeration is the really big issue. So food is one of the things that's really making it viable for people who aren't as lucky as we are and able to get out of town so easily um, to be able to stay put in a way that's not going to be hazardous to their health. Yeah, definitely. With that in mind, y'all, what we wanted to do besides just letting you know that James is doing okay, 
Uh, we wanted to share a little bit of footage from just the part of the city that I was in, which is very like on the ground. This is not journalism. It's just a little bit of a, of a first person view. I took a little bit of a bike ride in the area around where I live, and this is an area that did pretty okay. So we're qualifying what the really, really serious impacts were in this footage that we're gonna share in a minute. You're gonna see, you know, downed power lines, fallen trees, some damaged buildings, but stuff that really doesn't stack up against the more extreme things that have happened. One of the big things that happened in this storm that hasn't happened in previous storms is that there were at least eight different transmission paths for power to get into the city that were destroyed, large towers falling over. Um, and so that's making it a lot harder for them to restore power to the city. Uh, Intergy, which is the main power company in New Orleans, has been working on sort of workarounds and ways to start up other power plants um, and get things going. There's a, new, there's a couple different nuclear plants in the area that were shut down right before the storm for safety as they should be. And so they've been working on bringing those back online, but you know, a nuclear power plant isn't an on off switch. It's a little more involved. Um, and so they're having to bring in boilers from out of state uh, to sort of preheat all the pipes and get everything going um, so that they can uh, get those power plants back online. They've said that hopefully some parts of the city will start getting power today, but they're still saying three, four weeks until the entire city is returned to power. And even then, it's probably sort of a temporary scaffolding of power, right? It could be months before the, the formal official, you know, power infrastructure is back in with all the redundancies it normally should have. So if you guys can do anything, uh, make sure that we don't have any more tropical storms uh, this season yeah because uh, the southern Louisiana is not gonna be as well equipped for it we're still in the heart of the season so for sure like I know first and foremost this channel is rooted in tourism and so those of you who were considering a trip here like definitely be watching the tropics be erring on the side of caution and definitely be keeping an eye on the power situation because just the ability um, I know uh, NOLA.com our, our main local newspaper was posting information about when various airlines were planning to resume service back into our local airport and other things like that will be you know that news is going to be trickling out little by little but it is completely possible that we could still have setbacks in the remainder of the hurricane season so definitely yeah. keep an eye on the uh on the national hurricane center that the noaa produces definitely hurricane season is technically june 1st through the end of november um, and that's held pretty true for the last 150 years, but in the past few years we're seeing storms later and later in November. So right now, the end of August, beginning of September, is historically the peak of hurricane season, but it doesn't mean there couldn't be other storms down the line. And Ida, one of the things that for me was the sort of scariest about it is how quickly it came up, you know. I think it formed in the Gulf on maybe Monday or Tuesday of last week, you know, and by Thursday or Friday, they were like, oh, this is a Cat 3, Cat 4 storm, you know, and that's when we made the decision to, to get out um, and everybody was sort of hunkering down and getting ready for what was to come, so. It's not a lot of warning. Yeah. So certainly stuff to be alert to, those of you thinking about coming. And for those of you who have just been following this stuff from afar, who haven't been considering coming, also want to pass along everybody else with the company is doing fine the folks that you've seen on some of our videos i've had some check-in with sandy daniel who just joined the channel for the first time a couple weeks ago is doing fine by and large folks have evacuated from town though not quite everybody but we've at least had a little bit of a ping from yeah, everyone absolutely yeah and you know again it's worth saying new orleans itself while it took a hard hit the city is okay you know this is not katrina for new orleans uh, at all some other communities in Louisiana have taken much, much harder hits. Uh, there's a community called Grand Isle that is, I think, considered the southernmost community in Louisiana, and it's way down in the Mississippi Delta. I, I heard a report the other day, there were 75 residents who decided to ride out the storm oh, in Grand Isle. Goodness. They literally experienced 140 to 150 mile per hour winds for hours. And for this hours. is, y'all, this is like these coastal barrier islands yeah. that are what weaken the storm before it gets inland to places like New Orleans and its surrounding communities. So, like, when we talk about the strongest hurricanes in New Orleans history, I mean, in Louisiana's history, like, this is one of them. Laura is another one. Mm -hmm. And one of the most impactful ones that predates modern measurement is one that happened in 1854, I want to say, which, like, 
on a very similar kind of resort island to Grand Isle just like broke this island in half yeah. like these things have incredible just elemental force and storm surges are not to be underestimated so yeah places that have no buffer of land between them and the gulf that's where this stuff is by far the scariest Definitely. But even much closer, like some of our, our search and rescue had to be done in Jean Lafitte, which is just a little bit south of New Orleans. So even mm -hmm. just a bit down into like Bayou country, just outside of the city, yeah. there's some pretty serious stuff going down. Yeah, so. and Laplace, Louisiana, just north of the lake um, on the I-10 corridor has been hit really hard. Um, you know, that storm surge, you don't think about it, but it forces water up the rivers and that water has to go somewhere. And so these communities get, you know, 10, 15 feet of water in some places uh, and it just decimates, decimates everything and then makes it harder to survive the wind portion. So it's, uh, it's pretty rough for the smaller communities in Louisiana. Yeah. So all of that to qualify the footage that you're going to see that I took from my bike uh, yesterday daytime is definitely going to be some of the milder stuff even though for those who haven't been through a hurricane before it'll be maybe demonstrative of the kind of stuff that we face just from experiencing those levels of high winds and a little bit of just what the experience of being there the day after is like so it'll be a little bit more of a just texture of the milder side of things by no means do we want to suggest that this is the extent of what has happened for a lot of folks thank you all so much for your concern and your questions and your support it's like a really incredible outpouring to see and you know I it's I, I, I pass it on to the city as a whole I just I, I love that y'all feel such a fondness for the place and that we've gotten to be the catalyst for that to even a tiny degree so thank you all so much for for the attention and the questions and everything and yeah. hope this sheds a tiny bit of light definitely and we'll get back to doing tours and videos as soon as we can sometime sometime <laughs> TBD <laughs> yeah, let us know what else we can share, what else you'd like to see. We'll do our best to, to pass along any information we can. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. See y'all. All right, y'all. Right, it's the first evening after the storm passes. We've got downed lines all over the place. Plenty of fallen or seriously damaged trees and uh, a few cases of some more extreme stuff so out biking this is a very low-tech little exploration but gutter falling down it's uh it's a little odd a summer day in the wake of these things because well, it's usually very hot here during the summer, and it's like cool and breezy following a hurricane. If you were just dropped into it, you'd have no idea what a disaster had just happened. It's a actually remarkably pleasant evening if you didn't know what was going on. Only really tipped off by the roar of generators all over the place and the uh, pretty regular sight of, of course these downed lines and of people from the power company going around to survey the damage and what needs doing so as of right now power is out across the entire city so we are going back to uh to the pre-electric era in terms of what darkness means. It's about to get dark. The theme seems to be just crazy degrees of luck. Obviously not for everybody, so I shouldn't be too general, but um, we had in one of the yards neighboring us a house fall down and in I don't know seven of the eight directions that it could have fallen it would have hit a house but it fell in the one direction where it went and that seems from what I've seen out here to be at least in my part of town a real fortunately common story lots of window protection door protection 
like this. I mean, that is not going to be an easy or cheap repair. But goodness, is that going to be a whole lot preferable to somehow fall in and hit harder. Sorry that I'm going into the sunset, just the direction I'm headed. We also are pretty close to the river where I live, which means high ground. So had this been a flood-related disaster, this area wouldn't have flooded under any but the most extreme circumstances. But wind was the big fear for this part of the city, and I guess that's the respect in which the way things have turned out Again, not at all for everybody, is a bit of a sigh of relief. Goodness. Yeah. Our pile of branches outside our place that Roby and I stacked up today was about a quarter that big. I wonder if they've passed by this street earlier, Napoleon. And lovely and resilient as these live oaks are. Man, do they like to drop. Oof. And here we go. That was not there before. But one way you're gonna catch Mardi Gras beads this particular year. We do hear sirens semi-regularly, which I don't yet know what to make of. Um, 911 is out of commission. Many people do not have phone signal right now, so even in an emergency, would not be in a situation to call anybody. And right now the estimates for power restoration are in the one week to one month range, and that includes for like hospitals so even though i'm perceiving some luck in terms of how structures have done it is a wide open question how you know a lot of people's basic needs in terms of survival are going to be met in the next little while Water is not even available in some of the city. And of course, outside the city, outside the levee system, some really awful, serious flooding and storm surge related damage has happened to being far from that and communication and news being kind of as poor as they are right now. Sadly, can't really speak to it. Just some of this scene here in the city. for all the bumps in the road. Wish I could say that was disaster related, but if you know New Orleans, you know it's not. I'm feeling them 
into. So even in just this area, nothing full on wrecked. I went a little further today and saw one building that had been just crushed to splinters, but not a full on house. making the most of it. Not much to do besides be on your front porch with your people once the time has come, once all the work's been done. A day like today, once it's all passed and once you find out what the uh, prognosis is going forward, Kind of about okay. How soon is gonna? How soon is power gonna be back? Howdy. No, not once. The day after, of course, you start by coming out and seeing how things look. And then, oof, goodness, that whole wall came down. And once you know what's up, there's a lot of cleaning up of branches. There's reconning the news as you get the chance, hearing about what ETA for power return is. And based on that ETA, you, uh, you have a generator, you switch it on and you power through for a little while. If you don't, as most of us don't, then power's gonna be back on in a little bit. You just hang tight. But if it's gonna be a while, then refrigerators and freezers have to be emptied out. If you remember from Hurricane Katrina, if you watched any of the coverage of that or saw any of the art made in response to it, refrigerators by the curb were um, one of the signature visuals. And imagine, Bad as that was on its own, imagine pairing that with the, uh, the current COVID-related chip shortage. It'd be a really unfortunate time. So, folks are trying to hang on to their appliances. Goodness, that whole fence. Wind, um, for most of it, was blowing in the direction that would push that fence over, and of course having so much foliage on it makes it catch more air than it would otherwise do. Yeah, so, seeing plenty of people gathered with their friends and their family, if you have a generator or the benefit of a gas stove, Knowing that power is probably not going to be back for a week or more, it's time to get rid of everything in the freezer. So, a 
big ol' meal gets made to finish all that stuff off in style. And in this case, it seems it'll be accompanying a great many of us out of town in the next day or two, those of us who are lucky to have somewhere else to go. So what's already a little bit ghosty here is likely to become more so.